Uh, don't have time. We got a surplus. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So we're supposed to want to, I want you to do. So we're going to turn in parts A and B. And what I'm going to do for part C is I'm going to uh, I'm going to make a short video, kind of re-explaining that, because I think um, there are lots of people that, that read through that and weren't weren't grasping what that was. So I'll make a short video, and I'll post it, and then we'll and then. Uh, we won't have a we won't have a hard due date on that right now, okay? So you get a chance to think about it and work on it. If you finished it, if you got it, great. Just hold on to that file, um, and then I'll give you further instructions later. So I'll let you know when I get that video put together. That I'll kind of talk you through it rather than readings, because I think people are having trouble with that. So let's turn in parts A and B for the homework. Everything but the file. All your written work, except the uh, graphic calculator file. Okay, please get the folding, the folding, the heading right. Get everything right. Remember, deduction will start if you can't. Don't do that right. Open side to the right. Today is the twenty-fourth. Okay, so we're right now we're right on the right on the edge here of talking about integration. In fact, we're going to talk about the idea of integration today. So all this stuff that we're doing leading up to it, uh, understanding the idea is crucial because the, the 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 symbolic nature of this is about to get very much more difficult than what we've seen so far. So the idea has to be in place, okay, as long as well as everything else we've covered. So. All these pieces that we've been developing are all essentially, you can't throw things away. And they're all going to play into this. OK, so we're talking about accumulation. So let's do it again. We do a constant rate of change. This is going to be, continue to be big. How do two quantities x and y change together if they change, if they vary with constant rate of change? OK, so everyone's. What's that? Okay, Ben, yeah, Ben, what were you going to say? Okay, a lot, more, a lot more specific than that, though. That's true. They, they change together. That's that right here. But how do they change together? We should all know this by now. We spent, like, I've kept reviewing it day after day. So if you haven't gotten it, you got to go back, and you got to review this. So Lizzie had it. So how about in the back? Someone in the back. Yeah. That's it. Changes in y are proportional to change in x. Changes in one quantity are proportional to changes in the other. And there were two major implications of this for us dealing with mathematics. What was the first one? This was the big one that we've been seeing over and over again. So if changes in, in y are proportional to changes in x, how did we use this? Yeah, David. That's right. So every change in y is some constant multiple of the change in x. Go back and review. If this is if you're, if you're not thinking this when I'm asking that question, you got to go back and just just go over this over and over until you got it. Okay. And what's the other big implication of this? What is that thing k? What is that thing k? k? Well, it is changing the average change in x. Right. That k, that constant multiple, then, is the constant rate of change. Every change in y is the same size relative to its corresponding change in x. That value k is the constant rate of change. OK. <clears throat> OK, so we have been talking about this. We've been talking about the tax due accumulation function. 
And my question is, we start talking about the idea of accumulation. Okay, so how can we symbolically represent the tax due on an annual income of 58,000? So I'm, we've stopped it here. We stopped the animation at 58,000. How can we symbolically represent the tax due on that? Two ways. We can symbolically represent the tax due at 58,000 two ways. We can do it as kind of like a lump sum, a total amount at the end of the year, or as the accumulation of small amounts of tax. All right, so the tax rate function. Here's the tax rate function. And here is the tax function. So first of all, how could we represent the tax due on 58000 as a total amount of tax? Given the setup here, how could we represent that amount of tax due? I'm not asking you for the value. I'm not asking you for how much money it is. How can we represent that value? He wants to plug 58,000 into the tax function. Will that give you then the tax due? Some people are slowly nodding. That's what the tax function is. You plug in a taxable income, it cranks out your tax due. Exactly right. Okay, how can we then, what about as the accumulation of small amounts of tax? How can we represent this as the accumulation of small amounts of tax? So we got the first representation. Tax of, this is function, right? Not multiplication. That represents that location right there. That's the tax due on 58,000. What about as the accumulation of small amounts of tax? What do we say? What do we say that the general idea is of something accumulating up to a final amount? And what we said up there. Sterling. Right. Little bits at a time. So what, what, how can we use the symbols here to say we want to, uh, we want to see the, the tax accumulating little bits at a time? All the way up to this tax amount. So the value is going to be the same, but it's just the way we represent it. We show it growing in little tiny bits, maybe one dollar of taxable income at a time. We're showing that the taxing tax is growing per dollar of taxable income. How would we show that? Reshma, any ideas? We want to show this value as the accumulation of small amounts of tax, like starting at the beginning of the year, every for every dollar you earn. It's like you're gonna drop the amount of tax you owe on each dollar into the jar every time you earn a dollar. So how can we represent that process mathematically? What's that? Okay, so the piecewise function is, is building that, that, that blue line over there. Anybody else have an idea? What is a little bit of an increase of tax due? If y equals tax x, what's a little bit of an increase of tax due? How could we represent that symbolically? Delta. Delta what? X. No, delta y. She wants delta y. Is that what that would be? Delta y represent a little bit of increase in tax due? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Okay, so the total amount of tax, we could put 58,000 to the tax function, or we could just add up the, the little bit of tax we get from the first dollar, but the little bit of the tax we get from the second dollar. How many terms will be in the sum? That dot, dot, dot means keep going like this until you get to this one. How many? 58,000. 58,000, okay. And so that is also, we could also say it this way. <coughs> Do you see how that gets the idea of accumulation? 
add a little bit of tax, add the next little bit of tax, add the next little bit of tax. But these two values are equal. So the tax on that amount and that sum of 58,000 things are the same amount of tax you owe at the end of the year. But the one on the right kind of has embodies the idea of accumulation. Does it make sense? Okay, so we what we want is a way of expressing this a little more nicely, okay? So what we do is we use this symbol right here, and this is not meant to, you know, this is about helping you, not scaring you and, and making you say, oh, math is hard, okay? This is Greek sigma, and it stands for sum, okay? It stands for sum. So since all these, all these pieces are pretty much exactly alike, we can, we can write it, just write these one time, and knowing that it's just going to be the same thing repeated over and over again. <laughs> so we're just going to write one term. Say delta y, but what is changing? It's which, which dollar of tax we're talking about. So we'll let that change. We'll call that i. So i is which dollar, which income, which dollar of the taxable income are we talking about? And i is going to start at what that, what number? What's the first number i is going to be? One. And what's the last number i is going to be? Fifty-eight thousand. So this right here is exactly the same as this. It says, first make I1. That's the first term of the sum. Then make I2. That's the next term of the sum. Then make I3, etc. So this is, this is for our assistance, not to make math scary. It's just a short, shorter way of writing that, that, line, that long string of 58,000 terms. Anybody have a question on that? So let's get some practice on this. So what would this be? So could we write this using the sigma notation? Again, sigma means, so we got, we're got going to have sum. Okay. And we can use the, again, we can use i. So i equals what to what? John Paul? One, and then what's the last one? 100. 100. Okay, so now what is it, what rule uh, acting upon I is it that we're adding up? I plus one. I plus one. David says I plus one. What do you guys think? So when I equals one, we want the first term of the sequence, which is what? The first term of the sum is one. Okay, and when the next number is going to be 2. So what is it, in terms of I, what is it we're adding together? It's so easy, it's hard. <laughs> Allie, what is it we're adding together? Wait. Erica. So this says, whatever we're going to put here, it says, do it first for I equals 1, okay, and that'll, that should give us that. Then do it next for i equals 2, and it should give us that. And then the next term of the sum will be i equals 3, and it should give us that. So easy it's hard, right? Yeah, Jason? It's just i. It's just i. Do you see? When i equals 1, we get the first term, 1. When i equals 2, we get the second term, 2. And that sums them all together all the way till i getting to 100. <coughs> Okay, so you you write out the first couple terms of this one. Yeah, Megan. Um, can we change i to zero and then and then have i plus zero um plus one and then be and then like yeah, you want to start this at zero, sure. Yeah. It's called shifting the index. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If we started i at zero, then this would be i plus one. Because then the for when i is zero, the first then we get the one. Yeah. Okay, so write out the first couple terms of this. <coughs> says i equals 1 to 90 of i squared. So write out what that means. So we, when we see this notation, we got to know what that means. So uh, write out what does that mean? What is that implying?
Jack, did you get it? Tell me. Okay. You agree with Jack? Yes. That's it. This says add up the integer squared, the square of the integers, add up every integer squared up from 1 to 90. <coughs> That's what we said, right? Okay, how about this? So you can do this. Now, I is actually not part of the, like, the formula. You're not going to crank on I like you did here. You take I squared. But it's just the index. It's representing different values of R. Every time you change I, you get a different value of R, rather than you're actually doing a computation on I. But it works both ways. You can do it. use it both ways. Jessica, can you tell me the first couple terms? Well, if I is 1 on the first one, we just one times 2 Yeah, I is an index. It's not, it's not a number that we're like computing here. It's just the index. It's just that changing I is going to change, it's going to be a different value of R. So it's not multiplying or dividing or anything. So what would the first term be? Which R? Going to be different R's, and so we're going to label them. So which which is the first one? R1. R1. R1 change an X. Plus? Isabella, what's the next one? R2 change an X. Plus? R3. And how many will we have, Patrick? There'll be how many terms? N. Whatever N is, that's how many things we'll add together. And we'll start with R1, R2, R3, all the way up to N of them. Okay, so now use summation notation to do this one. Use summation notation, write a sum that will give you this. Okay, use, and use J instead of I, so just, you know, just for a variety of sake, instead of I this time, use J. Okay, Ben, you're up. Tell me what to write around this. K in the top is the highest value, okay? Start with J equals 1. What do you guys think? People like it. Yeah, that's it. Questions on the summation notation. Why are we doing it? Because this is what accumulation is about. Accumulation is adding up a quantity bit by bit by bit. So we want a, a, a kind of a shorthand way of describing a long sum where we're adding up things bit by bit by bit. Okay, let's just um, reacquaint ourselves here with this. So we'll just go through these fast. Where in this animation do you look? This is the rocket power basketball, right? Where do you look to see the time elapsed growing? Where do you look in this to see time elapsed growing? I'll do it. Okay. 
x-axis, right? So that black bar is showing you time increasing. Showing you time increasing. Okay? Where you, should you look to see the velocity, basketball's velocity for the current value of the elapsed time? Yeah, this, this is showing us at any, any given time, it's showing us what the velocity is, right? The y-axis on the left-hand graph. Okay? Where in this animation should you look to see the basketball's height for the current value of elapsed time? Yeah, the y-axis of the graph, okay? So it's it's basically where the ball is, right? It's where the ball is if you, uh, at any given time. What does it mean, the current value of the basketball's height, when that mount currently constantly changes? Would you agree the height is continue, continuously changing? Every moment the height is changing, right? It's increasing. So what does it mean, the current value of the basketball's height? How can we make sense of that? Jessica? Just like last time we can call it this. Right, so if we, we'd have to kind of pause life for a moment. If we pause it, then that ball would be at some particular height. That would be the current value of the ball site. Okay, so a point on the left-hand graph. So let's pause it again here. Perfect. So that point right there, what does it represent? Danny? The rate at which the ball is moving and the time. Right, it's two pieces of information, right? <coughs> a point on a graph gives you two pieces of information the, the time that's elapsed and also the current speed or rate. Okay, why does this velocity jump discontinuously? Why does the, the basketball's velocity versus lap time, the left graph, jump discontinuously? Yeah? Because the rate of Okay, so, so the question is why? Yeah. Uh, the basketball is um, increasing in speed okay. at, a, every, at certain points. So its speed or its rate of change, speed <coughs> per second, is rising. Okay. It's accumulating. It's accumulating, for sure. Um, so is, it, is the speed just ge gradually accumulating? Does the speed just gradually, in gradually increasing over time? Yeah, it's getting propelled and pulled, exactly, propelled and pulses. So every, within a half second here, the speed is, within any one of these given half seconds, is the speed increasing? No, it's constant. And then the next rocket fires, and boom, it jumps up to the next higher speed. Okay. Okay, so here's an important question. In what way does the basketball's height accumulate? How is it reflected in the graphs? So in what ways does the basketball site accumulate? John Paul? Uh, it's the sum of the distances traveled at different uh, velocities. Okay. The sum of, okay. And how, so how do we see, how is the, the y-axis over there showing the accumulation of height? How is it showing the accumulation of height over there on the y-axis? Yeah, Ben. It's showing each of the intervals that moves up. Okay, so each dot represents what? What do each of these little dots represent? So, for instance, from this right there to this. Represents the distance that goes up in what amount of time? In half a second. And how does that compare to the distance that goes up up here in a half a second? Yeah, so every one of those red dots represents the half second marks. So in between each pair of red dots, that's showing, it shows not only does it show the change in height, but it also shows one half second going by. Do you see that? So each each um, pair of red dots next to each other shows one half second, and then the distance between those red dots shows the distance, the little bit of distance that the ball goes in that half second. So that's how it's accumulating. You think of accumulating up all these little 
bits of distance, one half second at a time. So how can we symbolically represent the height of the ball at six seconds? So let's call this over here. We'll call this the rate of change function. Rate of change height x. And we'll call this the height function. Plug in the time gives you the height at any time x. So our time, time since the launch is x. x is number of seconds since launch. <coughs> this one over here, we could, we could say it's the velocity at that time, or the rate of change of height. So when we call a function r, it's, for us it's going to mean rate of change. Rate of change of height, or velocity, and then h of x. So how can we represent, so here I'm showing 6 feet. So, uh, I'm sorry, six seconds. We pausing, we're pausing the animation at six seconds. How can we show, so you guys try to take a minute. How can we represent the height of the ball, the height of the ball is at six seconds as a single height and as accumulation of little changes of height. Go, see if you can do it. So this is back to the text function we did earlier. How can you show it as a single height, symbolically? And then how can you show it as the accumulation of little changes in height? Okay, Ryan. Any any progress? I haven't gotten there yet. How about as a single height in feet at six seconds? How can we use the notation up here just to show single height in feet? How about zoo? So how can, on the left there, <clears throat> how can we show the height of the basketball at six seconds symbolically as a sink as just a height in feet? Trevor. This is this is the easy one, I hope. Alright, Isabella. That velocity is, we've got lots of different velocities up to six seconds, right? The velocity keeps changing. Erica, how can we represent a single height in feet at six seconds? Um, the, the e looking thing is called the same, same height. This is just what is the height at, so it's not, that would be for accumulation. That would be for accumulation, right? Y equals h of x. And so at six seconds? I'm talking about at six seconds. No, this is the height, you guys. The height at six seconds. How do we represent the height at six seconds? H of six. 
age of six. Nothing. I'm just asking about the height. I'm not asking about the velocity. I'm just asking about the height. And that's what the height function does. Given a time in seconds, it spits out what the height is. So now how can we see it as accumulation of little changes? Right. Our age of six. And you grew that. See, it has the accumulation of little changes in height. I think so. It's our age of six. But let's, yeah, so let's do that last. Let's do the sigma notation last. So, right, accumulation is a sum of little changes. Little changes in what? Little changes in R? Delta H, right? Delta H. So we have delta H1 in the first half second. Delta H2. Let's see, little changes of height. That's exactly what the notation says. Delta is the change in height. So a little change in height plus a little change in height. How many of these will we have if, if each one is a half second? Six? Twelve. And those are equal. So we can add up the little changes in height every half second for six seconds, or we could just plug six into the function. And we get the same value. We get the height of the basketball after six seconds. One is in terms of the function. The other is representing the idea of accumulation. OK, so now use your, uh, practice your sigma notation. So practice your sigma, sigma notation and set up that in that way. Mason, did you get it? OK. So we could use i or j, whatever you want. What does i start at? What value does it start at? Does it start at 6? 0? We, we haven't ever started it at 0. We, it's, it's easiest if you just started at 1, because that's the first one, right? Start at 1, and it's going to go up to 12. And so then what is each term like? Delta H of sub i. See, the nice thing about the sigma notation is we don't have to write out 12 delta H's. We can just write 1 because they're all the same except for which, which one it is. All right, that's too low. See, now we only, instead of having to write this out three times or 12 times, we can just write it once because they're really all just about the same except which one we're talking about. And we can note that by just changing it each time, 1 to 12. So that, will, that is the exact same thing as this red expression here. Anybody have a question? So what's the idea of integration? So this is key. We want to have this idea in place before the sim symbols get even harder. Okay, the symbols are going to get even harder. And so to make sense of those symbols, we've got to have the idea. So what is it? It's that the value or total change of a quantity can be calculated as the sum total of many little bits of change. And that's what we talk, call accumulation. This is the idea of integration. We can, we can get a total change of a quantity or the, the total value of a quantity by looking at it as having accumulated in little bits. Delta y1 plus delta y2 plus delta y3 plus delta y4 or delta h1 plus delta h2 or delta tax 1 plus delta tax 2 plus delta tax 3. Little bits of change. We add them all up to get the final value or a total change in quantity. <coughs> so we said the tax due on 58,000. We could just plug it into the tax function, or we could represent it as 
this accumulation. So which one of these two possibilities, the first or the second, represents integration? Shows the idea of integration. Plugging 58,000 to the tax function or adding up all the little bits of tax till we get to that amount of tax. First or second? Second. The second way is what's representing integration. That's right. Okay, same thing with the height of the basketball. In six seconds, we said it's h of six. <coughs> or it's the sum of 12 little changes in height. Which one represents integration? Second. The second. The sum of 12 little changes in height. That's what integration is about. <coughs> so now what if we were to... What if we were to also let, so this is what we've seen so far, what if we were also let time increase over here in the right graph? And instead of graphing these changes in height on the y-axis, we kept those changes in height above the number of seconds we were at. Does that make sense? So now we're going to let this thing move along with the number of seconds. What would you see? Okay. Well, maybe a piecewise graph. Sort of like a, sort of like a well, how do you know that? So it's a piecewise, piecewise linear? Um, well, each thing, like, each thing would be constant. Each part of it would be linear. Okay, so we have little linear pieces, and then the overall shape of it? And be like slowly getting steeper. Yeah, each, the slope of each of those little pieces would be steeper than the one before, right? Because the slope is the rate of change. So would you believe that that is a piecewise linear function? Would you believe it? It is. That's not a curve. Those are a bunch of little straight line segments, just like the piecewise linear functions that we were doing. <coughs> Can you see it? If I zoom in? You see it better there? Okay. What we want to investigate now is this idea of these little changes in height. Okay, these little changes in height, and we want to look at it in the context of this of our piecewise linear function. That's that's the height function, right? So. What does a point on this graph represent over here? Let me stop it. So if I give you a point over here on this graph, what does a point on that graph represent? That particular point. He said the height at that time. That's right. It's two pieces of information. At a given time, that's the height of the ball. At a given time, that's the height of the ball. That's what points on that graph represent. Okay. So, uh, we've got all these different velocities, right? These rates of change. And we said that the accumulation of the height, we could think of as this. Okay. We said this, right? How many were there? Up to six seconds? Well, actually, this is eight now, so how many would it be for this picture? Sixteen, right? Every half second, two per second, so it'd be sixteen. <coughs> okay, so this, this velocity right here, 
corresponds to uh, let's see it starts at two seconds okay so right here so where does the change in height come from in the next half second it comes from letting time change by half second and then we want the corresponding change in height so that right there see that right there that's the change in height from starting at two seconds to two and a half seconds so this is our when which delta H would that be delta H5 right because it's the fifth one one two three four five so that's the fifth little change in H in that half second interval is time and height changing with constant rate of change? In that half second interval, is time and height, are they changing, those quantities changing with constant rate of change? Therefore, what does delta H5 equal? Okay, everyone think about it. If those are changing with constant rate, what does delta H5 equal? Okay, so X is number of seconds since launch again. So what does delta 5 equal if height and time are in constant rate of change, co-variation? How many people think they know it? Oh, please. One. This is why we went over constant rate of change over and over and over and over again. What does it mean if, if they are in constant rate of change, co-variation? So this delta H5, that's like change in Y, right? That's like change in Y. <coughs> what does it equal? K delta X. So when you figure out what's K and what's delta X, go. What's K? No, symbolically, represent it. What, it. what is it? How do we represent it symbolically? So, yeah. Yeah, so what is it here? What is it in this case? What is, what is that? What is the change in height by the change in time for this half second? asking for a number. I'm asking for symbolically what is okay. Um, it's the rate of change. What's the rate of change in this half second? What's that value? What's that number? V5. 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 Okay, so this is that little change right there is delta H5, which is V5 times delta X. Changes are proportional, so the change in time is always, or the change in height is always the constant rate of change times the change in X. Okay, and that's represented over here. Right there, V5 delta X. Okay, in the next... In the next half second, is there a constant rate of change in the next half second? So what will that delta H6 be? This little change right here. V6 
change in x. So here's v5 change in x, v6 change in x, see what I'm highlighting? v7 change in x, v8 times the change in x. So each one of these little increases in height is the constant rate times the change in time. <coughs> So this little change right here, that's this. This little change right here, v6 change in height. That little change, etc. One more. Let's see. Yeah, v11. That little change right there is the delta h11, which is v11 delta x. So these little, the little vertical lines represent changes in height, okay? And we can rewrite those using our proportionality of changes as the rate times the change in time. The rate times the change in time, and add those up. Does it make sense? So in the first 11 intervals, what does that represent right there? Somebody tell me, what does that first term represent? What value would that give you? The height in the first half second? What would this give you? The change in height in second half second. This would be the change in height in, right? Because the changes in time are proportional to changes in height. We can write changes in height as rate times k times change in time. Okay, so write that symbolically. So write that with sigma notation. Is this what you got? We can call that, say, D11. Okay? That's the distance in the first 11 half seconds. I equals 1 to 11, VI delta X. The accumulation of 11 little changes in height, expressed as the rate times the change in time, rather than expressed as delta H. Really key here. Okay, so now what we want, now is where it gets trickier. Can we come up with, for any time, what's the distance or the height at any time? X, okay? So that was just for 11 seconds. That, that expression you just wrote, that was just for at 11 seconds, the accumulation of the height. So what about for any time X? So it's gonna, we know it's going to be one of our piecewise functions, right? That, that chunky curve that we had over on the right? It's going to be piecewise. So what does this say? This says that in the first delta x, or first half second, the change in height is going to be this much. So now let's see if we remember all our piecewise stuff. How are we going to write what it's going to be from, so the next interval will be from what to what? Let's do the interval first. So that will be from what to what? The next line. So in terms of delta x now, so delta x to 2 delta x, right? It's going to start at delta x, it's going to end at 2 delta x. So in this interval, the second, the second for us was half, excuse me, second half second, what will the function be? So if we have an x value between delta x and 2 delta x, what? rule or definition is going to give us what it is.
What kind of function is it? No, just this part. What's that? Linear. linear, right? This is a lot of linear groups. And what's our linear function? M times x minus a plus b. So we just got to get all the parts here. What's m for us? V2. What's what was AB again? What was AB again? X minus delta X. Okay, plus. So now we're gonna we're gonna stop doing this recursive thing, and we want to do it explicitly. So we want to write explicitly. How much height was gained before? How much height was gained before? How much, t how much total height was gained in the first interval? V sub 1 delta x. That's right. It's what you would get if you plug delta x into this first line. OK. In the next part, V3 times x minus What's our starting point now? No, what the starting point is 2 delta x plus how much total height have we accumulated so far now? V2 delta x. Is that it? Plus V1 delta x. And then this is in the interval from delta x less than or equal to less than 3 delta x. Thank you, 2 delta x. Thank you. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you where this is going, and then we'll pick it up here next time. So, everyone got that much? Well, it's going to come out right anyway. So. We got that. So as this continues to build, we're, we're moving towards this form. So what we're able to do then, here, here's the point. We're able to then write this no longer as a piecewise function. It is a piecewise function. It is many lines glued together. But we're going to be able to write it in one line. So that's what we'll pick up next time. <coughs> you know, we'll, you don't have to drop that down. Okay, so it's time to hit the books. It's going to get hard now. All right, I just want to give you a heads up. The homework that's for Wednesday, um, like half of it is kind of over stuff we did in class, and then you're, I'm kind of asking you to read and learn, learn beyond, and then ask some, answer some questions about that. So uh, the homework may be a little more challenging. Uh, office hours, email me questions. I just want to. I just want to hit you to have the right expectation. Uh, we may all have to step it up, even for those who have been so far. Okay. See you Wednesday. No, tomorrow. Tomorrow we have a quiz on all of last week's stuff. Nothing from yesterday. Nothing from today. Nothing from today. The quiz tomorrow is from all last week's stuff. What's about a uh, swapping